Washington state is in the middle of a hand recount of a statewide election. And specifically, this is the election to determine who will be on the ballot in November for Washington state's public lands commissioner race. Now, this is interesting for a variety of reasons, even more significant than the final result of the statewide election. A variety of significant problems, I believe, with our election system have been exposed in the middle of this process, and it is worth putting a very bright spotlight on the election system right now, while we're still a few months away from the general election in November. But before we jump into the latest saga about this 2024 election cycle, don't forget to go down below and hit subscribe and like, and also share this video with others particularly your apathetic friends who don't want to take the effort to vote this year or who have given up on voting. Their laziness or apathy is exactly why we have this hand recount going on right now. We are living in very interesting times, and this is not the time to be apathetic or for your friends to surrender in advance of an election. However, it is the time to pay attention and to share this video widely if you want to know more about what is happening in Washington State, and even if you don't live in Washington, why it matters because crazy stuff just like this is probably happening right where you live too, but usually very few people are watching. So, okay, back to this hand recount for the recent 2024 primary election from just a few weeks ago here in August. Uh, basically, in Washington State, I produced a few videos recently discussing the significance of the August 2024 primary results. Now, Washington state actually has some very weird election systems compared to the rest of the nation. Primarily, it's the fact that we're an all mail-in ballot state, which means essentially nobody votes in person, nobody shows their ID to vote, and the ballots just trickle in for weeks as the U.S. postal system discovers mystery missing ballots all over the place, and for the ballots that were not tossed in the ditch, the dumpster, or lost en route, and they finally actually got to the local auditor's facility. Now, this significantly delays the final results of any close election, as only about half the ballots are even on hand on election night itself. Now, keep in mind, ballots are widely distributed just throughout the whole state without any chain of custody or certainty that they get to the real voters. But that's a story for another time. Now, the other weird part about Washington State's election process is really this just top two jungle primary system. And I've done videos about this before, but this is where everyone, regardless of party affiliation, they get put on the same primary ballot, and then the top two vote getters, they're the ones who move on to the general election in November, and that's regardless of whether they're part of the same party or not. Now, with that background, as I originally discussed in my initial video about the primary election results, after the first night of preliminary counting and reporting, it really looked like the top two vote getters here were the state, for this is for the statewide office of the public lands commissioner, it appeared to be two Republicans. They were in first position was Republican former third district congresswoman, Jamie Herrera Butler. And this is not a surprise considering her funding and experience with campaigns. She is the only one that we can be certain is going to be on the November ballot. But in second position was fellow Republican Sue Kell Peterson, who was officially endorsed by the Washington State Republican Party back in April. And then close behind her was Democrat Dave Updegrove, who's pictured here on a demonstration photo of his plans for Washington State's forests and who currently occupies a seat on the King County Council. Now, as the ballots kind of trickled in and were discovered around, all around the state, the gap between the second and third place finishers, Sue Kell Peterson and Up the Grove, it actually got closer and it switched back and forth quite a bit. The final initial count had Democrat candidate Dave Up the Grove with 396,300 votes, which was just 51 votes ahead of Republican Sue Kell Peterson at 396,249 votes. Now, this basically gave each of them 20.82% of the primary vote. The leader, Republican Herrera Butler, had 22.03% of the vote, with 419,297 votes cast for her. And then the remainder of the votes were kind of split up between four other Democrat candidates. Now, under Washington state law, a mandatory hand recount must be had in an election where the difference is so statistically small, like the statewide election, with a, just a 51 vote difference after over 1.9 million votes were cast for the statewide office. Now, you can read the statute for yourself at RCW 29A.64.021, which I'm also going to link down below in the video description for those who want more details. 
Now, before I get into some of the drama on the recount itself and then some of the problems that we seem to be uncovering, let me just point out just a few, few, I believe, salient points for all of you out there who believe your vote doesn't matter or nothing matters or Jesus is coming tomorrow so it doesn't matter or whatever your excuse is for just not taking the very few minutes it takes, maybe take it away from doom scrolling on your phone to actually cast your ballot. Now, I hope this is a wake-up call of sorts, or at least it should be, because your vote most certainly would have mattered in this race. So I'm going to point out that over 91,000 Washington state voters who completed their ballots right here, and they sent them in, they didn't even bother to check the box for anyone in the public lands commissioner race. So these people who, they, here's people who actually took the time to complete at least part of the ballot, and they managed to drop it off at a drop box or take the risk of mailing it in, but they were too confused or lazy to bother to fill out at least one more oval on their ballot for the public lands commissioner position. Now, some of these undervotes would have gone to either the maybe the losing Democrats or the leading Republican candidate, and those votes might not have made a statistical impact in the current results. But certainly enough of those remaining votes would have gone to one of the two candidates that are currently in limbo and that could have been enough to ensure a different outcome than what we're currently witnessing right now. Now, even more significantly, I believe, even just a 1% increase in the number of people who bothered to take five minutes, maybe, and complete their ballot by August 6, this would likely have impacted this race enough to change the current results. I mean, we witnessed a statewide participation rate here eventually that reached 40.91% in this recent primary election, which is substantially less than four years ago. You can see right here, leading up to the 2020 election, every four years I did the presidential race analysis here, but more in line with previous presidential election cycles that, again, I've detailed here. Now, I won't rail too much about the 40.91 participation rate because I do believe that this is understating what I think is the true participation rate, just based on the sloppy and mismanaged process of inflated voter rolls and then the unwillingness of most auditors in our state to properly clean up the voter rolls in the first place. However, even a slight increase in participation would have prevented this current hand recount and close election that we see going on right now. So let me shift into kind of the wonkish policy side of my interest in this hand recount effort. And first, I want to just mention, I actually think hand recounts are great. I mean, they operate as kind of a quality control mechanism to verify the accuracy of the machine counting systems that we really currently use all throughout the state. And it is rare that we have an opportunity to see such a large operation happen all across the state in all 39 counties. People who have followed my efforts on the Washington Voter Research Project effort that I've had over the recent years and before that time when I worked at the Freedom Foundation, you probably know that my concern with elections and election accuracy has been mainly focused on the voter roll cleanup and verification process, more really than with whether the mechanical machines are properly recording votes. Part of this is because I've been involved in observing and tracking just a large number of hand recounts in the past 15 years. And while we actually have found many discrepancies, mostly these are relatively few and generally understandable when we dig into them. The 2020 recount for a few precincts in Orcas Island, for example, that concerned me because of the few vote discrepancy that they did uncover and then they really never resolved up there. But generally, with that kind of exception, I found most of these hand recounts to be a good way to just verify the system accuracy and with all 39 counties doing this, this really is kind of a good quality control check that we have right now. I wish we did a much larger random sampling of hand recounts by precinct, I would do it statistically, every year. And from just a policy improvement perspective, I believe that we should push for more hand recounts in the future, even if the auditor's offices around the state hate them. So the fact that such a large hand recount effort right now is underway, I actually view this as a good thing. So let's get into the ugly side of the election process and let me explain why I think that we're finding some real problems that have been uncovered just recently in this 2024 August primary election in Washington state. And I wanna reemphasize that we're only discovering or noticing these problems just because of how close this specific race was at the end. I mean, we wouldn't know about these problems if it hadn't been so close. So, okay, for those who actually wonder about the problems of all mail-in voting systems, I'm going to give you kind of a variety of reports from around Washington State where, unfortunately, ballots were finally received from the mysterious bowels of the Byzantine post office system. 
uh, clearly postmarked in time to be counted for the election, but due to incompetence at the U.S. Post Office system, they were delivered days after the election was certified, so it took them weeks to get them there late. Now, those people most definitely were disenfranchised because they were naive enough to trust the post office to actually deliver their ballots in time, but they were wrong. Obviously, most of the mail-in ballots were presumably delivered in time, but at least I have, for example, 89 ballots in just one county that I'm aware of, and there are almost certainly more than this. Now, their votes certainly won't be counted, and this wouldn't happen, we wouldn't be paying attention to it anyway, if these voters had had the option to vote in person. And if there was not such a close election where literally every ballot is going to matter, this would actually pass unnoticed like it probably does every year in every election. But this year, it clearly matters. And for this election, it clearly did matter. And the fact that our elections are outsourced to just this other failing government bureaucracy, the U.S. Postal Service, it's very cold comfort to the many people whose votes will never be counted, even though they did everything under Washington state law correctly. And this is just the beginning of my concerns on this recent election. Now, before I go into the next two obvious red flags that have been uncovered, I have to explain another weird and joyful side effect of an all-mail-in ballot scheme, just like we have in Washington State. So when these ballots are basically submitted by the voters or mailed, they are supposed to have the voter's signature on the outside of the ballot envelope. Now, in theory, this signature should match the signature on file with the county auditor for that same voter. Although this is kind of a weak security element to the system, sometimes the auditor's systems are actually going to catch signatures that don't match, but more commonly, they will actually notice when there's just no signature at all on the outside of the ballot envelope. Now, in these cases, there's a law that allows the voter to be notified of the problem, and they have a few weeks, even after the election day has long passed by, to cure their ballots by submitting a form with the correct signature on it to make their vote count. So they must have this process completed before the certification of the election, which happened just last week. Now, usually in close races, both political opponents, uh, they basically have volunteers or they have paid people running around that list of potential voters for rehab ballots to make sure that they get submitted and counted. Now, if they can identify the party affiliation of the rejected voter, obviously the respective party is going to emphasize submitting their voters' ballot rehab forms to the auditor's office. And this is just part of the month-long election process that we have in Washington State. And the skills and efficiency of getting these ballots rehabbed really matters in very close elections like this. So with this background in mind, here are the two problems that cropped up just recently. First, we have a possible example, I believe, here of active partisan voter suppression in Whatcom County by the county employees who work at the auditor's office up there. Now, I'm receiving reports which appear to indicate that when some Republican volunteers or Republican paid support staff were submitting their rehab ballots, a larger than statistically normal number were rejected by the auditor's office. Now, this was only after the auditor's employees were grilling the volunteers or Republican paid support staff to verify which party or organization that they were affiliated with when they submitted these rehab forms. Now, this appears to not be the case when left-leaning organizations were involved in the exact same process at the exact same time in the same county. Now, this is still under investigation, but if it turns out to be an accurate representation of what happened up in Whatcom County, we believe that at least eight, probably more, Republican-leaning voters were basically suppressed by the partisan county auditor in Whatcom County. Now, voter suppression is still voter suppression, even if it is a Republican voter that's being suppressed. I realize this is a hard concept for some Democrat partisans to accept, particularly if you went to Evergreen State College or Western, but it is still true. Now, secondly, and even more significantly, in Washington State's largest county, King County, which basically includes Seattle, that's the dominant city there, the King County Elections Department may have created the biggest and strangest problem so far. And I realize that for most Washington State residents, this may come as no surprise, but for my viewers not familiar with the history of bizarre election problems in Washington State, approximately 28% of all ballots cast in this recent 2024 primary election just a few weeks ago are processed in one building in South King County at the Elections Department located in Tukwila. 
Now, this building earned the nickname the Fraud Factory after the 2004 gubernatorial election when Republican Dina Rossi won the election, and then Dina Rossi won the first recount, and only after the second recount where a mystery batch of convenient ballots were discovered in the trunk of an election worker's vehicle. They discovered these, and then they counted them, and suddenly the governor's race results shifted to Democrat Christine Gregoire at the time. Now, while some laws and processes since that time have changed, the Fraud Factory nickname is still used frequently to refer to this building in King County. Now, the weird problem this time around is that unique in Washington state, the King County Elections Department, they actually use a strange online app to let voters remotely log in and then cure their problem ballots. The program is called OmniBallot and is run by a hard left organization called Democracy Live. Now, in Washington state, this program has primarily just been used to support the weird and largely unregulated votes for the Conservation District Board of Supervisors, which is in this weird little exemption. They're largely exempt from Washington state's campaign finance laws and regulations, kind of an archaic element left over from the 1930s. However, this program is apparently also used now, recently, to allow random people to log in and then cure their ballots. And it appears that 3,456 ballots were cured in King County. And reportedly, and this is according to reports from an election worker in King County, approximately two-thirds of these cured ballots, reportedly again, were cured using this kind of black box program. Now, at the very least, this would appear to be an unequal treatment for King County voters versus the voters from other counties in Washington State but with no real ability to audit what this organization does as a middleman for the elections process in King County. And this raises, of course, real concerns about the validity of these ballot cures. Did they reject Republicans who attempted to use the system? Can they even verify that only the real voters, actual real voters, as opposed to some other program, cured their ballots? Could outside organizations maybe use the program and then cure likely voters for their candidate only, and thereby giving that candidate an unfair advantage in such a close race? And these are the questions that we should all be asking. It is also really not insignificant that Dave Upgrove here, the Democrat candidate on the edge of this recount process, is also conveniently enough a King County Councilman himself in charge of determining the funding for this department and ultimately for this outside vendor. Now, nothing about this process is really clear or certain. The lack of clarity and transparency has always been a major problem in King County, but at least this surprisingly close race has given us an unusual opportunity to have a statewide recount and expose what I believe are some of the deficiencies in the system for all to see, good, bad, or ugly. We deserve to know something semi-close to the truth. Now, we'll try to keep you updated on the unfolding drama and the statewide recount process. It's going on right now as I'm producing this video. It's a good, I think, to shine a light on the problem, and it is sometimes the fiascos, the failures, and the disasters, in my opinion, that allow us to better identify the core problems, the policy weaknesses, and the bureaucratic failures that should be addressed. It's one thing to have a theory about how these things should work, and it's quite another to witness the problems in all of their glory and wonder, which can't just be swept under the rug. Now, there will be consequences, and it will be far more than just who makes it through to November's ballot for the Washington State Public Lands Commissioner race. However, as interesting an opportunity as this does actually represent for those of us wonkish enough to care about the minutia and the details and how governments actually function and how they actually work, the truth is we can avoid this type of nail-biting drama if some more people were involved in the elections process and didn't just ignore their ballot or toss it aside. So while this recount will involve election observers and auditor staff in all 39 counties, and it might include some lawsuits and litigation as these types of close election dramas often do, let this also serve as a wake-up call for those of us who actually care about liberty and freedom and who want to elect better people to political office who just might care about the same things. So here are some action items, and I'm going to close with these for you as we also look towards this November election coming up. First, there are many good reasons why you should not trust your ballot with the U.S. Post Office. And the most obvious is that you can't be sure it will ever get delivered to the auditor's office in time to be counted, as hundreds of people probably just discovered. Now, probably it will be. Most of the time, I think they get it there. 
but you can't be sure. So if you care about your vote, your neighbor's votes and your friend's votes, make sure that you put those ballots into a drop box. And I strongly suggest doing this as early as quickly as possible and even better, hand deliver it directly to the auditor's office in person. That's usually what I end up doing. At least then you can be sure that your ballot was received and counted that way. Now, if you don't know where those drop boxes are located, you can easily find them with a quick search online wherever you live in Washington state. Secondly, if you really want to observe what is happening this election cycle, volunteer to be an election observer. Work with your local party leadership and the county auditor's office to be part of the team of people who are observing what is actually happening in real time. Sometimes, sure, it probably feels like watching paint dry, but it wasn't really intended to be kind of a sexy process. But the civic engagement and the experience is very helpful. And you will never know when you'll be the person who actually catches something the rest of us have missed. Or when your presence, maybe that helps moderate the behavior of those who might consider doing something just a little bit shady if they think nobody's watching. Now, finally, even if you don't think that your vote counts, please take a few minutes and help out the rest of us who do care about our community and our state and our future and who are just trying to make a difference. Fill out your ballot. Vote yes and pay less on the initiatives. Vote yes for the people running for office who seem like they're the most oriented, perhaps, towards liberty and freedom. But get those ballots in as early as possible. It just costs you nothing but a little bit of time. Every vote doesn't always count, but sometimes it really does, as we currently are witnessing with this public lands commissioner race right now. And if you don't vote, you clearly don't matter in this process. So to anyone in office or the government, you, they don't care about you. And you can change that. And I'm not asking you to put in a lot of time, but voting is just the marginal level of civic engagement that literate people can have. And while most of us can, can and probably should do far more than just this, voting should be a minimum standard. If you care about the future, and I suspect most of us do care about our future, but the future belongs to those who show up. <laughs>